today's colloquium is Professor Dao Kothawala. Uh, Professor Dao graduated with a bachelor's in electrical and electronics engineering and a dual master's in physics from Bits Pilani in 2005. He obtained his PhD in theoretical physics from the Indian University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Ayuka Pune, in 2010, followed by postdoctoral work at the University of New Brunswick, Canada, and has been at IIT Madras since 2012. His research interests lie largely in classical and quantum aspects of gravitational physics and their implications for the unification of quantum theory and gender relativity. Recently, he has been exploring new geometrical tools that can provide a peek into the nature of space and time at the smallest of scales. He hopes this will shed light on quantum aspects of space-time and gravity and tell us something about space-time singularities, black holes and the early universe by leaving some relics that survive the h-bar tends to zero limit, much like the grin of the Cheshire cat. Welcome, Professor Dawood. Yeah, uh, let me begin by thanking the colloquium team uh, for inviting me to give this talk, and Nirmala in particular for regular reminders. Uh, I would also like to thank Divya Jyoti for the kind introduction. Okay. The title of the talk is, as you can see, Quantum Probes and the Architecture of Space-Time. Uh, no, I have kept it over there. So I'll be speaking about quantum probes and the architecture of space-time, and I think meaning of this is a very, very generic title, but I hope uh, as we go till the end of the talk, the meaning of the title will become clearer. It's a deliberately broad uh, title, but I'll try to indicate what specific results we can obtain by analysis of quantum probes, specifically in curved space-time, and what can it tell us about the basic uh, architecture of space-time itself, okay? I hope if you're not familiar with the general relativity, I would actually start with a very, very quick crash course in GR without any equations. I'll just try to indicate so that the jargons are clear and then I'll <coughs> indicate the main results, okay? So that's the plan of the talk. Uh, I'll start by, as I said, a very, very quick uh, uh, indication of the basic concepts of general relativity, that is gravitation as space-time geometry. But I'll try to present this in a manner which will appear to be important towards the later part of the talk. Okay? So I would highlight the key points of GR as we understand it. GR is general relativity. And then I'll try to see what our modification in understanding of space-time would imply for our understanding of gravity itself. Okay? They are interconnected. Next, I'll go to what I'm going to call as the mesoscopic domain of space-time. And this is the domain which I uh, would characterize as the one in which gravity is not completely classical, but you are also not doing quantum gravity. Okay, so it's some, some, somewhere in between. And this domain also should become clear as the arguments proceed, okay? Specifically, when I come to the final result. There are two important clues towards quantum gravity that appears when you actually do what are called as thought experiments. These were made famous by Einstein, Gedanken experiments, in this mesoscopic domain of space-time. And these have been known for decades. One is that there exists a zero-point length to space-time. Uh, for the undergraduate students here, this is very similar to having a harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics. In classical mechanics, your harmonic oscillator has uh, lowest energy, which is zero. In quantum mechanics, it's half h bar omega. In exactly the same way, space-time, uh, has a zero point length, which is roughly of the order of Planck length, but its exact value does not matter. Just that it's not zero is what matters. And the second aspect that there is some thermodynamic aspects associated with gravity and space time. Again, something that became popular after Hawking radiation and all those things were discussed in the context of, discovered in the context of black holes, but goes much beyond black holes itself. Okay, I can, I will try to indicate where the results come from. Then I will actually indicate some recent results with uh, students here, Hari and Raghavendra, about putting probes, both classical and quantum mechanical probes, whose analysis actually sheds light on both of these aspects. Accelerated probes are relevant for the thermodynamic aspects of gravity. 
the precise formulation of uncertainty principle, this is the same good old uncertainty principle that you learn in quantum mechanics, but when you do it on a curved background, it tells you something about how this minimal length or a zero point length of space time can come about. So I will do both of these analysis in a slightly more rigorous manner and indicate what uh, modifications come to it from the curvature of space time. And finally, I will go on to discuss the quantum space time. So I'll collect all the bits and pieces discussed in this part of the talk and try to put them together in some kind of a semi-classical way. That is this mesoscopic domain, right? Partly quantum, partly classical. And try to get some insights into the nature of space time beyond the classical one that we already are aware of. Okay. So right before I start, I would just like to anticipate the conclusions of the talk by uh, I, I hope by the end of the talk, the, the moral of this story will become clear, how it applies to this particular talk will become clear. There is a very nice uh, example of what are called as singular limits. This might appear like it's coming out of the blue now, but it's going to be pay playing a key role in bulk of the talk by Michael Berry. Okay, and it essentially says that suppose you are biting into an apple. It's an example of a singular limit in mathematics and you, you, you find that you know, there is a good chunk of worm embedded inside the apple. That means that you have eaten part of that worm. So the smaller and smaller fraction you find in the apple, you feel more disgusted because you have eaten more of the worm. Okay? And if you take this limit seriously, finding no worm after taking a bite into an apple would actually mean that you have eaten the whole worm. Okay? And you should feel very disgusted if you actually find no worm left into the apple. That's an example of a singular limit. Okay? And it's telling you that somewhere this way of taking the limit is breaking down, okay? And this is exactly what I'm going to end up with. When you have a space-time which has some kind of a non-local structure due to the existence of a minimal length or a zero-point length, it can leave its imprint even at the classical level. Even when that zero-point length is eventually tuned to zero, it can still leave some kind of an imprint and that's the imprint that we are going to uh, demonstrate in the context of gravity. So this I've already explained. This is just a cartoon version of what I call as the mesoscopic domain of space-time. Somewhere where all the fundamental constants of nature would play a role. But you are still not doing quantum gravity which would lie at this corner. Where quantum mechanics, gravity, speed of light, all are going to be equally important. This is some kind of a mesoscopic domain of space-time. Okay? And this is how you can plot the various theories that we are currently aware of on this so-called dimensional pyramid. So this is just to set the domain in which the talk is placed. I like to show it usually at the beginning of my talks so that we are clear that this is not quantum gravity and we are also clear where you are going beyond the classical theories. Okay. And these would be the key themes that I'll collect together right in the end. As I already said, structure of space-time at small scales is what will be the key theme. The other key theme would be the analysis of quantum probes. Clock is what I have drawn there, but clocks and rods, that is the initial primitive units which Einstein introduced in his paper on special relativity. And he already emphasized there that these will play a key role in how you ascribe uh, physical effects with a given theory. Okay? You have to set up your coordinate system using material objects. And that's why the quantum mechanical properties of those objects should play a key role in your characterization of space and time itself. Okay? This lies at the heart of what you might have learned as time dilation, Lorentz transformations, and all those things. Okay? You need those physical objects. And finally, I will uh, indicate what the connection of all these things are with black holes and thermodynamics. So all these were already indicated in the plan of the talk. I'm just putting it... Uh, in a scattered manner so that I am I, able to indicate in the end how these things are connected. Okay, So these uh, bullet points in blue will be the main uh, uh, characters in this talk. Okay? These are the topics that I would want to talk about. Okay, So collecting two main insights from this mesoscopic studies or what is technically called as quantum field theory in curved space-time, this also in the plan of the talk was already indicated, is that space-time can have thermal properties and when you combine gravity and quantum mechanics, there's an, there's an existence of a zero point limit. I already said that. But based on this, you can ask the following questions. If space time can have thermal properties, can you explain these kind of things from a more fundamental point of view? Because when you talk about thermodynamics, there is a statistical mechanics behind it. Okay? So along the same lines, you can, start, you can start talking about the statistical mechanics underlying these thermodynamic features of space time. 
In the same way, whenever there is a zero point length of space time, you are actually breaking on the face of it the very first axiom of matrix spaces that we learned, right? The identity of the indices and others. So if two points are the same, distances between those points should be zero. Okay? That's the very basic high school definition of you know, matrix space, one of the axioms of uh, matrix spaces. You break it, and so uh, you need to find some other mathematical description for space-time at small scales. What I'm going to illustrate is if you do this seriously, it will eventually throw some light on the top part as well. Okay. So let me start by quickly indicating, uh, uh, with a very quick introduction to GR. And that starts from Einstein's great insight that gravitation is space-time geometry. And what this means is that you uh, check out gravity from its status as a force. You don't think of it as a force, but as curvature of space-time. And for understanding this, for those of you who have uh, you know, not been introduced to the language of GR, is to imagine Earth-Moon system and say that a force, the gravitational force, the Newtonian force between these two should be understood in terms of the curvature they produce. Both will produce curvature, of course, and both are moving in each other's curvature, okay? And that's how, uh, uh, this curvature itself has information about the gravitational interaction between massive objects. That's the moral of the theory of general relativity. So what it does is uh, it combines the already updated, uh, the revised version of picture of space-time coming from special relativity, which was this. So what special relativity did was changed our conception of space and time, which we learn in PH101, right? So Newton says that at each instant of time, you can do your dynamics. And then the study, the dynamical equations of motion is essentially the equation that relates value of the dynamical parameters at a given time to those values of those parameters at a later time. That's the meaning of the equation d2x by dt square is equal to force divided by mass. Okay, so those, that's the way it is done because the time that appears in Newton's laws is a universal time. So you can draw these universal slices according to that time. Special relativity tells you that you cannot do that. You cannot travel at a speed more than the speed of light. So there is a bound given by this orange portion, that's a light cone. So you cannot communicate with signals outside the light cone. Okay, and hence your future and past is fixed or limited to the events within the light cone. Okay, that already tells you that a large chunk of this picture is gone as far as you are concerned. Okay, so you should be doing physics only causally connected with you. Events that you can affect or events that can affect you are the only things which are of relevance. Okay. Uh, coming to general relativity, that was special relativity. In general relativity, when you try to actually generalize the laws of special relativity to GR, you need some more physical input. And the input which Einstein used was the observation that was centuries old, that you know the gravitational and inertial mass of every object has the same ratio. It's a universal constant. Okay, you can take falling apples, they fall with the same acceleration. So that's an observed fact. And what Einstein did was to try to use it to distinguish gravity from other forces. So no other force, for example, if you were working with electric field instead of the gravitational field like this, that would not work because the ratio that comes between the acceleration and the field is the ratio of charge to mass. That's not a universal constant. Okay, it's only inertial to gravitational mass, which is a universal constant. So the moral of all this, and that's the basis on which uh, GR is based, is that uh, everything falls at the same rate under gravity because they are actually following special paths which are called as geodesics in space-time. Okay? So that is a key jargon that you should take home. And we will see uh, what modification that does to our understanding of gravity. So now you have gone from Newton to gender relativity, special relativity I have already indicated. And what that does to you is what I've indicated before. It tells you that if you have a massive object, it will curve space-time. Objects are moving in that curved space-time. And basically, you can use local uh, properties. You can use your differential geometry, if you're familiar with it, to describe any curved manifold and be done with it. Okay, That's the theory of general relativity for you. Okay, But uh, you can go beyond, beyond just the analysis of constant accelerated motion. And if you have a big enough lab, 
you see that these objects are not falling with the same acceleration. They are actually uh, moving towards the center of the Earth. And this so-called tidal force is what is represented by an object called as curvature. Okay? And this can be represented by a simpler example. Okay? Imagine creatures moving on the surface of a sphere. If you remove the sphere, and you are, so on the surface of the sphere, these guys are just following geodesics, the natural paths that I just to, uh, spoke about. But if you don't see the sphere, you will interpret this as the attraction between the two objects. Okay? What we are going to see is that this interplay between acceleration and curvature will play a central role when you go from classical probes to quantum probes, but it will also play a key role in the analysis of classical probes itself. Okay? So I'll come back to this. Uh, this is just summarizing the previous thing, that the tidal forces, forces which can stretch you or compress you in a gravitational field are captured by curvature and not acceleration. Okay, so that I will move part. And this is the content of Einstein equation. So I have curvature which I have just described. It produces tides. Okay. I have energy momentum of matter which we learn in all the courses in classical as well as quantum uh, theory of classical and quantum fields. So there is a certain kind of equation that relates these two and these are the Einstein equation. Okay, so that's roughly the historical flow of events. I will skip the mathematical steps except giving you two objects. The way of measuring distances in space-time is given by the metric. This is the mathematical version of this equation, Einstein equations, where this object is called as Einstein tensor, that's the energy moment. This is for those of you who have done these courses, those are the objects, okay? Uh, so the first thing I'm going to question, and that will come in uh, the last part of the talk, is whether this description of geometry in terms of a metric tensor is correct when you are looking at space and time at the smallest of scales. Okay, so we'll get there. And similarly, what is the physical significance of Einstein equation? This will become clearer when, when I discuss the thermal aspects of space times with horizons. Okay, so let me proceed now. Uh, let me come to the mesoscopic domain. That, that was the second point in the plan of the talk. Okay, and as I said, it gives you two clues. So I want to discuss those clues very quickly before going ahead. Let me start with the zero point length of space time. And uh, this analysis is very old. Okay, so the first paper was in 1950s and some papers even before that, in which what you do is a simple non relativistic calculation. So what you do is ask how do you assign coordinates to events in space time by using clocks, only clocks, no rods. Okay? So there's a clock moving on this trajectory, you want to assign some coordinate, some coordinates to a nearby event. What you do is send a light signal, okay? imagine that it's reflected from that event, comes back to you, okay? and you measure the proper time difference along the trajectory between the emitted and the received light rays, and you then you do your quantum mechanics. So this result all follows from the solution of Schrodinger, non-relativistic Schrodinger equation with one change. The change is that you take the mass of the clock into account. Again, in a non-relativistic manner, there's no relativity here yet, okay? If you do this simple experiment, what you see is that if you take the mass of the clock into account and you take gender relativity into account, what it tells you, uh, I want to emphasize here that taking general relativity into account does not necessarily mean that you have relativistic motion. You can still move non-relativistically, but take the gravity as given by general relativity. So this clock will produce some dent in the space-time in its neighborhood. That's the picture I showed you of Earth, Moon, and all those things. And you better want to be outside the radius of curvature of that clock, okay? Because if your, if your event 2, to which you are trying to assign events, is not outside the radius of curvature of the clock, then the whole process becomes operationally ill-defined. How, how do you assign event or coordinates to an event which lies within what is called as the horizon, the event horizon of the clock itself? I don't see any Planck's constraint here. Uh, it's all, uh, edge bar and all is set to 1. Okay. Yeah. So this is, for example, edge bar T by capital M. Just the Heisenberg equations of motion for the operators x and all. So yeah, <laughs> I, I should have put the constants, yeah. So if you put the constants, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, it's bad that I did not put it in because that's where the constants matter. So what you analyze just from this non-relativistic thought experiment combined with some general relativity is that you cannot measure 
events to a precision better than a quantity L0. This L0 is G H bar by CQ. H bar and C has been set to 1, okay? But it's actually G H bar by CQ ka square root. That's what is called as Planck length. And this forms the basis of almost all the thought experiments that tell you that space-time has a lower bound. If you had done, by the way, the same experiment in your course uh, in quantum mechanics, you would have gotten a number which is just related to the, you know, the Compton wavelength of the particle. That's what you usually get. So this is a bit of a fundamental bound. Quantum wavelength of a particle depends on its mass. It's not universal, but this guy does not. Okay, so that's the zero point length of space time. And then there are lots of references that have discussed this over, over the last several decades. Uncertainty principle and all those kind of things uh, in presence of gravity. I will not mention all these things. But the second key implication of such a zero point length, this is technical, I will not go into details, is that it also regularizes the two point correlators associated with quantum fields on this space time. If you have a zero point length, and if you do some certain scattering calculations in quantum field theory, there are very, very generic results starting from the work of DeWitt long back that says that the singularity structure of the two-point functions is also altered. So they become UV finite, okay, in the coincidence limit. That was the first thing. I want to come to all these points again. Okay, so I'm just summarizing the work that has been done in this area so far. The second clue from the mesoscopic domain of space-time that we already have is the thermodynamic nature of gravity and space-time. This is also something I mentioned. And this is something that is probably more famous than the first one. It started with the laws of uh, uh, black hole mechanics. So if you have a black hole, people soon discovered that they satisfy laws which look uh, tantalizingly similar to the laws of thermodynamics. Now, can I ask a question on yeah. the earlier slide? Yes. Yeah. The earlier one. Yeah. No, 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 the next one. Yeah. Here, yeah. Um, these are very different methods, right? Yes, yes. These are very different methods. Yeah. And uh, there have been questions about that kind of regulation that you're talking about on top is actually uh -huh. can be, you know, obtained, say, from quantum conformal fluctuations. There have been some Correct. concerns, right? Yes, yeah. So th those concerns are actually related to slightly more technical point as to which two-point <coughs> function this is. So the most recent concerns have been whether this is a Feynman-Green's function or a, whether it's a propagator or a Green's function, okay? So in certain cases, this regulator is not there. In the other cases, it's there, but those theories uh, actually are, I mean, they, they are not treating conformally flat space times. But yes, yeah, with conformal fluctuations, this works for Feynman-Green's function, okay, not the, uh, not the retarded or the advanced ones. Yeah. Yeah. And what do the Agudo et al. claim? Yes, so what these people claim <coughs> is that the relevant deformation of the two-point functions is something, so they don't work in this way. What they say is that if you take a Green's function G in your background space-time and regularize it like G divided by one plus L naught square times G, so th this does not have a very good motivation. Uh, they claim that there's some mo motivation from conformal field theory for this, but it's a direct deformation of the two-point function, okay? You can see that if it has this structure, it is exactly the same deformation that I've written, but generically it can be different, yeah. Daud, so <clears throat> should I consider yeah. L0 as a lattice spacing or something? Yes, it's, there have been models in which L0 has been considered as lattice spacing, but some people don't quite like it because there's an impression that if you introduce a lattice, it breaks Lorentz invariance. It's not completely true. Just introducing a lattice does not break Lorentz invariance, but that is the reason why. But there have been interpretation of this as a lattice spacing, so discretizing the theory. That is most evident in, yeah, this Ohanian's work on path integral, where you actually have a path integral and do that path integral by discretizing space-time with a lattice spacing of the order of L0 to the power 4, which is the dimension of the volume of space-time. Right. Yeah. Divided into cells of that size, yes. Yeah. So, 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 any, so any theory, any field theory written in, 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 in such a curved space-time automatically gets a regulator, is it? And I'll, uh, well, it does not. That, that's the thing. So this has been all, like Shiram also pointed out, this has been rough set of calculations 
where one way or the other some extra assumptions enter. Okay, what I will be trying to do is precisely find a structure for space time which naturally incorporates a zero point length so that such a kind of regulator naturally comes if you are doing quantum fields on the modified space time, solving for Green's function on the modified space time, this L naught square comes embedded okay. into the very structure of space time. Okay. That's what we expect, right? I mean, uh, th th that's one of the problem with all of these approaches is that they take the zero point length, they find a two point function which is deformed, but it's no longer a two point function in some metric, right? You have to satisfy, you have to find a kernel of the box that the Lambertian operator to find a two point function. That has to be done in a specific metric which is, which is still the background metric. Okay, that's one of the issues with several of this. Okay. So yeah, uh, uh, coming to black hole thermodynamics, we have known these laws for decades that uh, if you write down the laws of black holes, uh, they satisfy these laws similar to the laws of thermodynamics with the role of entropy being played by one quarter of the uh, area of the event horizon of black hole. That's just 4 pi r square where r is 2, 2 m, 2 g m by c square. So it's all very simple <coughs> set of laws. It's not even difficult to derive. You can ju if, if you just know the black hole solution in general relativity, it's one step from there. Okay. Temperature is defined, uh, temperature that you read off from here comes out to be inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole. Okay. So for black holes that we are aware of, it's a very small temperature, but it's one of the key uh, results by Hawking. Okay, and then there is also an analog of second law which says that the area in any physical processes involving black hole area always increases. Okay, so uh, basically all these discoveries in 1970s motivated the question that uh, can you violate second law of thermodynamics by just throwing entropy across such horizons. If I throw entropy in the form of hot cup of coffee here across the black hole horizon, then for the outside world you have reduced the entropy, okay? So it might seem like you have violated the second law of thermodynamics as, as far as the outside observer is concerned. And since, since there is some sense of democracy of all observers in general relativity, this guy should be able to describe all of physics by variables which they have access to, okay? So unless you actually attribute entropy to the horizon or to the black hole more generally, you cannot save the second law of thermodynamics and this is what Bekenstein's proposal was, okay? So, till that argument came in, all these laws were just considered mathematically fun set of equations with no physical meaning, there's no physical connection with thermodynamics. But the moment these physical arguments came in, it became clear that there is actually a physical entropy, the same entropy that we use in thermodynamics that you can attribute to black holes as well. And uh, so it goes also for temperature. There is actually a physical sense in which you can attribute a temperature to black holes. So then uh, these are the exact expressions. So uh, here I have put h bar over, so this all there. So this is actually Hawking temperature of a black hole. This is the entropy. So once again, without this L naught square, which is again of the order of Planck length, it's exactly Planck length. If you go back to the original calculations of Bekenstein, it's exactly Planck length. So there is some sense in which even for large black holes, you need this because if this is zero, you have infinite, entro uh, infinite entropy. Okay. Uh, well, well, this is again just to emphasize that it's, it, it actually, black holes actually behave like a real thermodynamic system. You can run Carnot cycle and stuff like that. So these are not attributes which are just mathematically attached to black holes, but more general than that. Okay, but I want to proceed from here and then people realize much later that, uh, in fact not much later, uh, almost at the same time, that you don't need black holes for all this. All you have to do is take flat space time of special relativity and put accelerated observers in that space time. And this was the result of Fulling, Davies and Unruh. If you have accelerated observer which are described by hyperbolic trajectories in flat space time, you have what is called as an Unruh temperature associated with them, which is essentially the temperature they will attribute. They will see the flat space time vacuum as a thermal bath at this temperature. And they will also attribute entropy to this red line here. This red line is just the light cone you draw if you have taken a special relativity course. That's just the light cone. That light cone plays the same role that the black hole horizon plays if you have a black hole there. So it all goes through. Again, the temperature is now proportional to acceleration. Entropy is 
uh, it's infinite because the area is infinite here. So you talk of entropy density that comes out to be 1 by 4 L naught square. Okay. So basically the logic after this went that just like Einstein used his freely falling frame, remember the freely falling apples I showed you right in the beginning of the talk, you can actually introduce locally accelerated frames. With freely falling frames, Einstein deduced that gravity is just a manifestation of curvature of space-time. That was my first few slides. With accelerated frames, you can deduce that uh, there is some kind of thermodynamics associated with horizons. And this essentially leads to some information about the dynamics of gravity. So the way that works is that you analyze a particle falling across the horizon that replaces your hot cup of coffee. For an accelerated observer, it's lost once it goes beyond the light cone. Okay, And this whole process looks like this in the accelerated frame of reference. What you do is you perturb the horizon slightly, virtual displacement in the sense of classical mechanics, and you find this nice relation that TDS is related to, uh, basically you recover the first law of thermodynamics, TDS equal to DE plus PDV. So what you have actually found is that if you take these local horizons of accelerated observers in special relativity, and you look at slight virtual displacements of the horizons, they are governed by the first law of thermodynamics. Okay. You have the observer should be accelerating. Yes, this is for accelerated. So the, this is the displa displacement I am talking about. Not for freely falling one, for accelerated one. And surprisingly, what you can show is that the logic works in reverse as well. If I impose this first law of thermodynamics to the virtual displacement, so the deltas in your first law of thermodynamics should be, should be associated with that virtual displacement of horizons. Then you recover, you discover actually a constraint on the background curvature which turns out to be precisely the Einstein equation. Okay, So you have found already a new route towards Einstein equation which is based on the thermodynamics of horizons. Okay, There is more mathematical structure here but it's summarized in this uh, sort of review of all these ideas. Okay. So uh, the history of these set of ideas uh, is quite long by now. and broadly goes under the term of emergent gravity paradigm. I will again come to emergent gravity paradigm next because that is going to be my, you know, the singular limit of the quantum space time that I eventually want to come to. Okay. So this is the results that I have discussed so far. Okay. So there is, for, for someone who yeah. doesn't know any of these, yeah. why should it be an accelerating observer? Because if you, yeah, so if you don't have an accelerated observer, you don't have a causal horizon like this. Okay? I am working in flat space time. If you are in curved space time, then there can be natural horizons occur occurring like black hole horizons or even some kind of a horizon set by background curvature itself. Okay? But in flat space time, uh, it only has to be an observer dependent horizon. Okay? And I call this a horizon simply because if you are here, you cannot send a light signal to this point. Okay. It, it is in this sense that this red line acts like a horizon. You are breaking the democracy of observers that you wanted. Uh, you are actually not, right? Because, uh, yes, uh, uh, that's actually an important question. You imply, uh, you impose this law, first law of thermodynamics. You get an equation which is an equation relating Einstein tensor dotted. This is slightly technical answer, but uh, Einstein tensor dotted with the four velocity of the observer. That gets related to the corresponding component of stress energy tensor. And then you argue that if this has to work for, or I can actually introduce accelerated observers uh, in any direction with any four velocity. If I want that equation to hold for all UAs, then GAV equal to TAV arises as a constraint equation. Okay. I'm varying it within all accelerated observers. Okay. But that is just a statement which I was just responding to Raj, that you need horizons for the thermodynamics to work, otherwise temperature is zero and you don't get any new insight from this. Yeah. So as I said, this led to the development of the so-called emergent gravity paradigm in which you think of gravity. So first we went from Newtonian gravity to Einstein's version in which gravity is geometry. Now we are sort of going back historically and you are saying that no it's not even that it's actually a manifestation of thermodynamics of something else okay but that something else is what creates a problem okay because we don't know what that is okay so uh, there are many emergent gravity models that are available and that work at different levels of uh, 
you know, their fundamental relevance. You can talk about emergence of gravitational dynamics, just the equations of motion, or emergence of gravitational action, slightly more fundamental, or the emergence of space-time itself on which you will then write down the action. Okay? What I am going to discuss in the rest of the talk will pertain to all these, but at different levels. I okay. will uh, have some answers for first two, not much for the last one. Okay? So that is the logic I have already mentioned it before. These are some of the supporting evidences. I have already mentioned it and this is just the application of how Einstein equations are related to the first law of thermodynamics in a more technical solution of general relativity. I am not going to go through it. Okay, you can find the generalization of these results. But this is the key moral of all the results. That your Einstein equation written symbolically like this are equivalent to the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, a drastic uh, uh, simplification. So you first make things more complicated in going from Newtonian gravity to general relativity and then actually go back to thermodynamics. And it all reduces to the first law. And it generalizes to a large class of more complicated actions. Okay. You can have much more complicated theories of gravity where you know, there are more curvature terms. Again, this is only for those of you who have been introduced to GR, otherwise we can ignore this slide. And it generalizes to more complicated examples. So this is all about gravity and thermodynamics, zero point length, one part of that scattered cartoon I showed in the beginning. Let me now come to the probes. Okay. So how do you probe these features of space-time? As I've already demonstrated, you need accelerated probes and you need some handle on how to do uncertainty principle on curved space-time. So I'll describe a couple of recent results which addresses both. Okay, I, let me start with accelerated observers in curved space-time. So, so far, uh, starting right from the beginning, I have told you that you can go to an accelerated frame of reference. There are horizons. You can do thermodynamics with those horizons. You get a temperature proportional to the acceleration. Okay, that's the summary. And right in the first slide, I had also shown Remember those two apples falling towards the center of the Earth? What I was trying to tell there is that if your lab is small enough so that you don't see this deviation of trajectories because of curvature, all things will fall with a uniform acceleration. This is one version of what goes under the name of equivalence principle. That's what I was trying to indicate. But now I'm going to go back on some of my statements. And this is a recent work with Hari where you realize that, you know, if you have acceleration present, it also picks up a certain direction. And maybe not all components of Riemann tensor uh, decouple nicely from acceleration. Okay, maybe some components of Riemann tensor contribute also to the effects due to acceleration. Okay, and this is an extremely important problem because the uh, use of accelerated frames is not related like I have emphasized here, it's not just related to you know, thermodynamics and horizons and all. Historically, in the history of classical dynamics, accelerated frames have played a crucial role in understanding what inertia really means, the notion of Mach principle, the principle of equivalence, which I have already discussed, and at a quantum mechanical level, the Unruh effect, which I have said. Okay? This accelerated observer seeing a thermal bath is what is called as the Unruh effect. So it matters for all of them, okay? not just for the specific context of this talk. Okay? So we asked that question and we specifically uh, noticed the Unruh effect, but I'll actually indicate another application which is to twin paradox of special relativity. So what I've shown you so far is the temperature of an excel temperature seen by an accelerated observer is this, okay? But what we can do is you can even talk about classical twin paradox. If you have taken some course in which special relativity was discussed, you can also ask uh, uh, what happens to the twin paradox. You know, you have two twins. One is accelerating, one is not. They meet after some time. Who ages more? That's a basic question in special relativity. And the answer is this. The twin who is not accelerating will age this much. Twin who is accelerating will age this much. And the acceleration, the, the, the relation between the ages is determined by the acceleration. Both this and the Unruh effect are related uh, by the same expression, okay? same expression between uh, the length of a geodesic connecting two points in space-time, which becomes the age of an unaccelerated observer, and, and is just for coming back. Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's the picture. So I, I, I'll reduce all of that to a simple picture. So you have two points in space-time, one connected by a geodesic, that's a straight line, one connected by an accelerated observer. You can put a classical probe 
or a quantum probe on these trajectories and ask what that relation is uh, in a curved background. Okay? I will reduce it even further to a high school level. This is just asking for the relation between something like a chord of a circle, the chordal distance between two points on a circle and the arc length distance. Okay, it's basically the same expression with sine hyperbolic replaced by sine. Okay, yeah. Isn't it solved? Isn't the twin paradox solved because there's acceleration and deceleration when the twin has to? Yeah, but that does not matter. You can actually put. That's what Shiram was saying. Yeah. So you have to turn back and come to the same point. Okay. But that you can smoothly, you can smoothen out the trajectory. Okay. Uh, I don't know what you mean by solved. Uh, it's addressed because it's not really a paradox. In, if you're meaning in that sense, yeah. It's understood because uh, you first turn it into a puzzle by saying that some kind of a paradox is involved because there's a symmetry between the two observers. That symmetry is not there because acceleration and deceleration has to take place. Yeah, yeah. So in that sense, yes, but that doesn't affect the expression. Okay, you can do it more carefully. <coughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, arc length and chord length between two points of a circle is translating to this in the Lorentzian space time. And I wanted to prove, and there, there are certain implications. Sorry, sorry, Ah, yes, sorry, Raj. Yeah, I went too fast there. So actually, En is the component of the full Riemann tensor in the plane of motion. Okay, so you project it on, it's called as the electric part of Riemann. Okay, I didn't want to go into that, but yes, that is what. That's what I meant, that the direction of acceleration picks out special components of curvature which couples to acceleration like this. Rest of all are dumped in this, which I'm not displaying. Okay. So that's one. Now coming to uncertainty principle, there was also a similar second set of results in which we analyze probes. Uh, in the framework of Heisenberg microscope that again you would have heard of in your basic quantum mechanics. Okay. That is how you deduce the uncertainty principle. So when you do Heisenberg-like uh, kind of microscope on a curved background, you have actually got to first define what is your momentum operator and what is your position operator. Okay, what are what is the meaning of an operator producing translations Out there, in the curve? Cell, yeah, apply to some uh, radiation from classical radiation from charges. Yes. Yeah. We have been thinking about that, but not yet. Yes. Yeah. In fact, it will also apply to things like Schwinger effect, which is also something like, yeah, yeah. So yes, so we want to now derive uncertainty principle in curved background. And without going into detail, I'll just tell you why it is important. So that's your uncertainty principle from quantum mechanics. Usually people have some fancy modification of this, which are all ad hoc because you know, what they say is that RHS will be modified by some momentum dependent factors in quantum gravity. There's no motivation for these kind of modifications. But uh, a better question to ask is whether you want to deform or the, whether you, this uncertainty principle gets deformed when you do it on a curved background, okay? That's a more sensible question because this is not a question in quantum gravity. This question you will have to encounter even if you are doing quantum mechanics, say, on a sphere. Okay, it's a curved space and you want to answer uh, what should you identify with momentum and position for this to be chronicle delta. And if you can't define position and momentum such that this is chronicle delta, what does that get modified? Okay, what is the RHS of uncertainty principle? So this is also an analysis that can be done by using some differential geometry. I am not going to go into the details, but basically it involves carefully defining translation operators in curved space. Because the generator of translation is what you call as momentum eventually. So you have to define what the translations in curved space mean very carefully. The generator of that translation you'd call as momentum. And then uh, once you have defined it carefully, you get I'm going to speak, skip all of this unless there's a question. You find that your uncertainty principle gets modified to this form. So basically, XP commutator becomes this. Momentum still commutes with each other. Position operators no longer commute. Okay. Uh, I will explain the meaning of all these commutators if there are questions. But let me just tell you where these deformations are coming from. These deformations are coming from after you have already accounted for the curvature of space-time in your definition of momentum operators by defining the translation generators carefully. And you take into account the curvature of the momentum space. See, the thing about quantum mechanics is that you have to worry about curvature of position space as well as curvature of momentum space. In special relativity, momentum space is flat. 
But generically, if you go to quantum gravity, it may not be flat. And if you then don't want to mess up with Lorentz invariance, if you want to do the most basic calculation in, in which Lorentz invariance is not violated, then you have a dispersion relation like this, in terms of which these commutators are written. Okay. F we are of p squared is arbitrary function. Yes. Yeah. F of p squared is arbitrary function, and at low and high energies, if you want to recover your non-relativistic quantum mechanics and all, then Just yeah, it should become p square equal to minus m square, which is your standard quantum mechanics. Okay. So, uh, fundamental length is buried in those areas. Yes, fundamental length is often supposed to be because, you know, there has to be some uh, deeper meaning to the fact that position operators don't commute. Okay, so that is where the fundamental length is buried in the RHS of this. Okay, it really depends on the nature of the deformation momentum space at very high energies. So anyway, those uh, that was the discussion of yes, sir. This asymmetry between x and p. Yeah. Uh, so is, is, should one read something more? I mean, the fact that the momentum is coming. Ah, yeah. What is the? Yes, yes. So that is the thing. In fact, uh, see this: which ones commute and which ones don't commute. You actually, uh, the formalism is completely symmetric in position and momentum because it it actually depends on translation operators which can be defined either in momentum space or position space. So in this equation phi A can be xA or pA. Okay. However, if you are working in a curved space time, the standard thing and the standard fact is that you can always redefine momentum operators by absorbing the curvature in the definition of momentum operator. In fact, uh, you can define a self-adjoint extension of the standard del by del xA by incorporating, this is the 2 by r term in momentum operator in spherical symmetry. Covariant derivative uh, It's not quite covariant derivative because uh, it actually involves certain different components of Christopher symbols, right? It's somewhat different, it, it involves derivative of root of g. It's not a fully scalar thing because there are multiple extensions of momentum operator, not a unit. Yeah. Yeah, so after that I'll come to the last part and yeah. Uh, so uh, in whatever time left, I will just try to connect or collect all those clues and try to say something about uh, quantum space-time itself, the nature of space-time itself at very small scales. Okay, so let me come there. Again, these are the things we have collected so far. And the question it raises is that... But you can tell us what is that R U F F. Ah, okay. I was waiting for a question on that. In fact, this part I have not even discussed. So that's the democracy thing that you were talking about and Raj was asking. I always talk about accelerated observers because they see the red line as the horizon. Suppose I move my focus away from the observer and focus on the coffee. Okay? That was the guy which was falling across the horizon, right? Which raised to all this question of violation of second law of thermodynamics. This coffee thing is falling on a freely falling curve. That's on a geodesic. No horizon is existing. But you can actually compute entropy of a you know, falling cup of coffee in a curved background. That is there in this uh, article of mine which I had referenced before. You find that that entropy also gets corrected by curvature. So this S and this RFF, uh, RFF is, is essentially the time-time component of Ricci tensor. Okay, It couples to the thermal wavelength and this small s is what adds to your standard thermodynamic entropy. You know log of V by whatever is the standard textbook expression for entropy of a thermal system, system at thermal equilibrium. Uh, this gets added to that. Okay. So already the same component which appears here, appears here but not quite in the same form. And the okay. constant diverges as you approach the... No, no, this constant is a number, uh, sure. yeah, it's a number. Yeah. But I have not been able to derive uh, a consist consistent first law for this entropy because there is no horizon there. Right? This temperature is just the thermal temperature of the hot cup of coffee. It's not the horizon temperature that appears here. Yeah. 
Yeah, so coming to quantum space time, the key question is uh, collecting all these results, what does it say about the small scale structure of space time? So again, I usually like to display this quote, which appeared in the lecture by Riemann, the very first lecture on Riemannian geometry. And I, I like this quote because, right, this was the first lecture on Riemannian geometry, but he was already anticipating that whatever foundations for differential geometry he was giving may not work in very small, where you will need some physical ideas to characterize the nature of space-time. So you may, not, uh, you may not have a good description in terms of metric and all those kind of things that he was postulating. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So in the remaining time, let me describe how you can actually incorporate the ideas and tools that we have introduced so far into the structure of space-time itself. So the algorithm is very simple. You uh, define first the distance between two points x and y. Technically, it's easier to define the square of that distance uh, in, in, in Euclidean spaces. Both of them are similar, but in Lorentzian spaces, where you have three space and one time, because this square of distances can have any value, positive or negative, there's a time-like and a space-like distance, it's better to work with the square root. Okay? And this object, sigma square, is often called as the singe world function apart from a factor of two. Okay. And what I would emphasize is that this entire business of introducing a zero point length in space time can be captured in a very simple sentence that the distance between two points is non-zero when the points are coincident. Okay? This is what I meant in the beginning of the talk when I said that your first axiom of metric space will break down. That's the identity of the indiscernibles. Right? If two events are the same, their distances have to be zero. But if you are doing a quantum mechanical effective distance, then your existence of zero point length can actually be captured by claiming that this distance does not go to zero in the coincidence limit. It is roughly of the order of Planck scale because of quantum uncertainty in the structure of space time itself. So it, whatever you are going to construct from this is not going to conform to standard laws of metric spaces, standard axioms of metric spaces. You have to break. Even your triangle inequality and things like that will go for a toss. Okay. So how do you do that? You realize that all your observations in space-time, all the entire conception of space-time is built on observations. You define redshift between a source and an observer by sending right signals. And then you can reconstruct the formula for that redshift in terms of what I just called as the singe world function. Okay? There is a different expression that appears often in standard general relativity textbook. But it can be reduced to this basic form. And that is why I think singe deserves its name to be attached to this, because that's the only textbook I know which actually gives the expression directly in terms of observationally relevant quantities. Okay. Lando it, also does. Uh, he doesn't, in yeah, not in terms of omega. And that plays a crucial role in the BGV definition as well. Okay. So without going through this, I will just depict the main lesson from this part of the work. It's that you change the description of space-time I showed earlier, which was given by Einstein, that you describe space-time as a curved uh, geometry with a metric given by GAB. Remember, that is the only mathematical object I described at the end of that crash course in GR in the beginning. You replace it by a non-local object, which is just going to give you distances. So if somebody gives you infinite number of pairs of such functions of two points, you want to reconstruct your space-time. And you want to do a bit better, because you want to reconstruct a space-time with a zero-point length embedded in it. You can do it in terms of D, but you cannot do it in terms of GAB. It's a local object. It cannot incorporate uh, the fact that the distances are non-zero when the points are coincident. All distances you compute using this will be zero when the points are coincident, just by the very nature of that object. Okay? So the singular object uh, can be constructed. I am not going to describe it. It's what we have been calling as the Q metric. It's singular in the coincidence limit, not unexpected. Okay. But the most important part of it, again, don't bother about the equation. Maybe you can go through the text, but I'll describe for you in words what that means. If you computer, compute the action, what is called as the Einstein-Hilbert-Lagrangian for gravity, out of that non-local metric, then take the coincidence limit. That coincidence limit does not diverge. That turns out to be finite. Okay. And if you put L0 equal to 0, so I'm slowly moving towards the Sashire grin that I introduced in the title and the abstract of the talk. 
In the coincidence limit, if I remove the minimal length that I put in, I get a purely classical term, no edge bar, nothing. Alpha there is a number. Okay. Alpha there is a number that so depends on dimension of space time. Yes, computing it. Yes. Calculating yes. Yes. Yeah. So I get a purely classical term which uh, in our initial paper we termed it as the grin of the Sashire cat. Okay. You put something in, but the limit sigma going to zero of the quantum metric was singular that takes you back to the to the Berry's quote that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Because that limit was singular, it had a non-trivial interplay with the L0 going to zero limit, and the order in which I take the limit actually matters. Okay, I take the coincidence limit, I actually force my theory to behave locally by taking this limit. It's an inherently non-local theory. And then I study the L0 going to zero term there. Okay, I get something which is not the conventional Einstein-Hilbert action that we use in our description of gravity, it's something different. The only reason why this plays an important role is because this is exactly the entropy density that appears in the emergent gravity paradigm that I mentioned in the middle part of my talk. You remember I mentioned that all this thermodynamics of horizons led to the development of emergent gravity paradigm in which entropy of space-time plays a crucial role and you derive Einstein equations as one of the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, there you start with an entropy functional that is characterized by this object, and that is why it plays a role. Okay, so uh, I think I am almost done. I, in the before I end, I'll just quickly summarize the key implications of this quantum metric. One is emergent gravity is a relic of quantum space-time. Okay, so you put a zero-point length, you remove it. What you get for the local theory if you do this is not the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, but something that is more in tune with the thermodynamic. Uh, something coming out of the thermodynamic interpretation of gravity. You can compute volumes and areas, much more rudimentary calculation using this quantum metric. And you find something very curious. If you find an effective dimension of your space-time using the quantum metric that I introduced, it turns out that the dimension reduces from four at large scale. So your space-time is four-dimensional, right? Three space dimension, one time dimension. It reduces to two at very small scales. Okay, That's the volume dimension of space-time. There's also implication for the structure of light cone itself. A very nice phenomenon that is called as asymptotic silence. If you go to very small scales, light cones squeeze up. So these dotted lines are conventional Minkowski-like light cones, 45 degree lines. That close up as you go to very small scales. So the points nearby do not communicate to each other. Okay, a phenomenon that has been conjectured by people under the name of asymptotic silence. It comes out naturally from the structure of the Q metric. And finally, this is what I was trying to mention to Sriram. You can actually apply this whole formalism to study space-time singularities. Okay, I don't want to go into this. But basically, you can compute curvature and all those things using Q metric instead of the GAB and see whether the space-time singularities in Big Bang or inside a black hole still are singular points. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is actually the summary of the talk. And... Uh, uh, it summarizes the key results. Okay, if I, if there are any questions, just a couple of slides later, I'll take the questions. So this is the picture I wanted to end up with. Okay, so I started from here. Okay, didn't discuss this part, so I'm not going to even mention it. Discuss the small scale structure of space time, thermodynamic nature of horizon, and how starting from here can leave a relic which can explain the thermodynamic features of space time that you usually derive in very very different manner. Okay. So I'll stop here, sorry uh, for exceeding, but we can take some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so you, you know, there are these things where you have some sort of a metric, and from that metric you, you do this holographic business, and then you say that you have some quantum field theory, and then yeah. you, you can make some statements about entanglement. Like yes, that. yes. So, yeah. can something similar be done with your Q? Uh, with your Q? Uh, yes, that is actually uh, what we are trying to do. This is a long term goal, but that sort of what you are saying yeah. is indicated here because the same applies if you have two probes on two different trajectories. Right. Then uh, the two point functions that connect those two points, depending on which of the functions you choose, it can describe entanglement or 
different kind of correlations and you can in that language what, yeah. what more information do you get if you use this a, a, actually nothing uh, raj because the formalism goes through okay uh, the modification of distances, which is anyway a free parameter here because we don't know quantum gravity, we have not assumed anything for how the distances are modified. Okay. Just the inputs I have said. Instead of those functions, you just use inverse of this W as a measure of distance. Okay. The key idea here is that two-point function have a singular structure which goes like one over square of distances. So I can talk in terms of distance or I can talk in terms of W. It's just reciprocal relation. So I can write that Q metric completely in terms of uh, the two-point functions. If they describe an entangled state, then I will capture it in the Q metric. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hello, sir. So thanks for the lecture. So, yeah. sir, how do you understand that the two same point don't have a zero distance between them? Like physically, how do we get that? So actually, physically, uh, the motivation for that is what I already mentioned in the initial part of the talk. So the idea is that if you want to do uh, any kind of measurement where you take into account the gravitational field produced by... Remember your Heisenberg microscope of quantum mechanics, right? What you do is you shine some, you, you know, sh shine some light on the electron whose position you're trying to measure. And then you see how, to what accuracy you can actually localize the electron. Now suppose you take into account the gravitational field produced by light beam itself that will additionally perturb the electron. You can also take into account the gravitational field produced by the electron itself. So these are all tiny fields. You never talk about gravity produced by light rays in a Heisenberg microscope. But if you do talk about it, you get a bound which is more fundamental than the Compton wavelength that you get in standard quantum mechanics. Okay, that's all I'm trying to emphasize. I think what you're talking about is why do you think you can capture it by demanding distances don't go to zero when points are coincidence. The thing is if you actually try to do all those calculations, finding the localizability and all those things in any of the different formalisms that I've mentioned, it's equivalent to having a distance function that does not go to zero when the points are coincident. It's like punching holes in your space or space time. You cannot determine events to a localization better than a lot square. Okay, it's similar to having a space with a lot of holes punched in. We are just trying to stitch the hole together and define a singular metric that incorporates this. Incorporate and sir, you also talk about the, the reduction of dimension from 4 to 2. Yeah. So sir, how do we time? So we still have time and dimension there also. Correct. One plus one. We don't know which dimensions uh, get killed okay. in that reduction. So I'll tell you how it appears. Okay, if you have a sphere, uh, its volume is 4 by 3 pi r cube, surface area is 4 pi r square. So basically that power of r gives you the dimension, information about dimension of space, either the area or the volume. Okay, what this measure that I have told you is the volume measure. Okay, you can take 4 pi r cube, 4 by 3 pi r cube and read off that 3 by taking derivative of volume with respect to log of r or whatever, something like that. Okay. That's what we have used and the only thing that changes is the volume computed using the Q metric. Okay, the structure is such that it's no longer 4 by 3 pi r cube at very small scales. That power of r gets modified. Okay, so it's an effective dimension. Uh, which, because Lorentz invariance is not being broken here, so I cannot really tell you which <coughs> components drop out. Okay. But you also had a smooth... Uh, you know, transition. Yes, transition. So yes. You have kind of fractal. All kind of, yes, yeah. So that's why the interpretation of that D is not, it's not an integer. Yeah. yeah. So you have fractal. Kind yeah. of yes, of yes, yeah. Thanks. I guess you can, uh, given a GAB, you yeah. can construct a QAB. Yeah. So if I take the Einstein Hilbert action yeah. corresponding to the QA yeah. and uh, consider mini superspace, yes, yeah, will I avoid big bang singularity also? Yes. So actually, for uh, uh, I have not uh, included it here. It was actually mentioned in the Chennai Symposium okay. talk last. For FLRW, we have been able to do the calculation. It's not published yet. But there are strong hints that if you take FLRW class of space times and analyze the full 
Ricci scalar corresponding to those space times, the divergence at t equal to zero goes away. That's the statement we can make. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's a pretty time. Com it's a numerical calculation. Is, yeah. You know, people will say that you have constructed your QAB to ensure that, right? But we constructed the QAB to ensure that distances yeah. are not because it doesn't happen for generically for all the space times. You mean black hole singularities? Are black not holes. We have not been able to do the calculation so far. Yeah. I mean, I can wave my hand and say that interior geometry of a black hole is similar to FLRW. It's a collapsing shell. Then apply it, but it requires much more detailed. You can use that Amosori. Yes, yes, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Understand uh, the association of temperature with the horizon. Is yeah. Associated only with the horizon, or do we associate the same temperature with things inside the? Planet? Well, that's a debate that keeps going on, okay? Because temperature usually measures in thermodynamics, it measures the average kinetic energy of the fundamental degrees of freedom. So your questions translate to where do those degrees of freedom live? On the horizon, something in the interior, okay? It's widely believed that they are, they are on the horizon, but we don't know. If, if we had known, I would have just given you the statistical mechanics which gives rise to that temperature. So we don't know that, okay? Yeah. But usual jargon is that you associate it with the horizon. By horizon, okay. do we mean like for a black hole, if there's a horizon, there are things inside the horizon also? Yeah. Well, things inside the horizon for real black holes, uh, uh, not real, old black holes, <coughs> is considered to be vacuum, okay? So old black holes in the sense that you wait for a very long time till the collapsing matter goes and hits the singularity and the black hole has settled down. That's when you expect the Hawking radiation to be thermal with a temperature which is the Hawking temperature. Okay, So it's largely vacuum and the entire density is concentrated at the singularity. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating talk. Thanks, Small piece of space time. Thank you. <laughs> All flat. Thanks. Thanks, Noah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.